Hello and welcome again to United Nations Academic Impact's Digital Discussion Series podcast. Today's interview commemorates the International Women's Day and also concludes our article series on women in science, technology and innovation. Our guest today is the founder of Uncharted Play, a renewable energy company specializing in motion-based miniaturized power systems. She has been listed in Forbes 30 under 30 and has even been invited to give a speech at the White House. She is Jessica Matthews, known by many for inventing the socket ball. Our discussion with her today will amplify our understanding of sustainable development goal number nine, industry infrastructure and innovation, and highlight the role of women in science and technology. Jessica, we're very excited to have you here with us today. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Now, Uncharted Play's vision is a world powered by the people for the people. Could you please illustrate this vision with a few concrete examples or case studies? Sure. So, for example, take uh, a place like Nigeria. It's the most populous country on the African continent. Uh, You know, I think number eight in terms of uh, population in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And it's a place where... Uh, whether it's on the federal government or level or the state government level, you know, the leaders will tell you that they don't believe in population control, Mm -hmm. which means that we could get to the place where within uh, the next 10 years, it's actually the third most populous country on the planet. Mm -hmm. Um, And however, you know, this is still a place that has, you know, a finite amount of actual space for people to live, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and a finite amount of resources to actually service the people who are, growing and living in this space. Mm -hmm. So the idea is how do you create technologies? How do you create solutions that are sustainable with the growth of the population? Mm -hmm. In particular, how do you think about solutions that turn the idea of the tragedy of the commons on its head Mm -hmm. so that as population grows and as more, um, you know, just more power is needed, you're actually getting more power from people being alive and moving. And so that's what we're doing with our technology on the ground in places like Nigeria right now. Okay. Whether it's looking at how we can incorporate our technology into sidewalks mm-hmm. so that on the busy streets mm-hmm. uh, where people are walking um, in the local markets, they're mm-hmm. able to power the street lamps uh, that they need in the evenings. Or uh, if we're thinking about even the roads um, and the congestion there, how can we look at uh, designing systems that can go on roads that can power uh, Wi-Fi and lights and other infrastructure level things? just from taking advantage of the motion that's actually going on in that space in real time. Okay, now that sounds great. So let's talk about Uncharted Play's Uplift program. Drawing from a powerful statement on your website, which reads, the world has a hope deficit, and there is a sense of urgency to achieve economic and social change through jobs, education, and opportunity. How exactly does Uncharted Play intend to solve this problem through the Uplift program, and who is the program's targeted beneficiary? So I'm always wary of the word solve. Uh, I don't think that we're necessarily trying to solve anything. However, we are hoping that we can significantly address this issue Mm -hmm. um, and do so in a way that allows us to work with a lot of amazing organizations and people who have been actively looking at how you can address the hope deficit um, and the issues with creative thinking and invention uh, in the use of of our world. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about who we're trying to target, Mm -hmm. we're specifically targeting those people who haven't had a seat at the table. What we mean are people who uh, consider themselves uh, disenfranchised in terms of their gender, their race, their uh, economic uh, setting, Mm -hmm. socioeconomics. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's funny when you think about people who don't feel comfortable uh, or comfortably accepted in the world of technology, entrepreneurship, and invention, Mm -hmm. it's actually most people. So it's very inclusive when you start to think about who doesn't feel like they're included. And so our program targets those people. We're targeting people who um, come from uh, lower socioeconomic socioeconomic communities in the United States, uh, Europe, and uh, in the developing world, you know, in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Um, We're specifically targeting youth, um, usually under the age of 18, Mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking to show these individuals that their perspective, their experiences, their quote-unquote struggles are actually uh, an opportunity to create the next great solution, the next great social invention, and actually they're most primed Mm -hmm. to come up with the things that will ultimately 
change their communities for the better, change the world for the better, and turn turn the world ideally into something that they believe that they have agency in. Wow, that sounds amazing. Now, on a lighter note, I have to ask this question for the millions of soccer fans out there. The Socket Ball is one of your first projects and arguably the one that pivoted you into the global spotlight. How does it work and what are its environmental benefits, if any? (laughs) So, yes, so the Socket uh, was our first budget product, and it was something that I invented when I was 19 years old. Wow. Uh, The Socket is an energy harvesting soccer ball, right? Mm -hmm. So it literally harvests the energy, the kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, Mm -hmm. that's at play in anything that's moving. It harnesses that and uh, stores that power in the ball so that as you play, the more you charge up the ball, Mm -hmm. and then later when you're done playing, you can plug in a lamp Mm -hmm. or plug in uh, a device to get the power out of the ball. Uh And then later we actually came up with the pulse, which is the jump rope that does the same thing. So uh, the, the benefits are the way we designed it The idea was, how can you see this as a replacement for a kerosene lamp? Mm -hmm. So taking what people already love to do, Mm -hmm. amplifying existing behavior, how could we provide something that was able to provide more light Mm -hmm. than a kerosene lamp would um, just from play and do so in a way that was more that was more sustainable for the environment and for the individual. So if you think about the use of diesel fuels right now, whether it's a generator, um, a diesel generator, or a a kerosene lamp, the use of these products is horrible for the environment. Um, In fact, living with a kerosene lamp is like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. And so when you're thinking about air quality, when you're thinking about uh, the the actual living quality within a space, Mm -hmm. our product not only promotes physical activity and the idea of being healthy and moving and living your life, Mm -hmm. but also allows for the one-for-one replacement of items like this, Mm -hmm. uh, like the the diesel generators and the kerosene lamps that have an additional negative impact on the environment. Wow, that's a very versatile product you created. They are fun and at the same time environmental conservation. It's amazing. Um, Now, in in a past interview, you stated that the greatest solutions for Africa may not come out of Silicon Valley or New York. You have to look locally. So using Uncharted Play as an example, could you elaborate on this statement in light of sustainable development goal number nine, infrastructure, industrialization and innovation? Sure. Um, So, you know, I think that for for an idea to not only resonate but to actually be applicable, you must have local input. Mm -hmm. You must have the community stakeholders involved in the overall development. Mm -hmm. Uh, For Uncharted Play, uh, that means not only uh, making sure we recruit a diverse team of people from all over the world, Mm -hmm. uh, despite being based in New York, making sure that we have people from India, Nigeria, Libya, et cetera, Mm -hmm. um, but also being based in an area of New York that's incredibly diverse so that we're continuously engaging with people who have different perspectives. Mm -hmm. When we raised our round, we moved from downtown to Harlem because downtown you'll meet two types of people living their life in one way. But in Harlem, you'll meet seven types of people living their life in 15 different ways, whether it's your rabbi on 96th Street Mm -hmm. or your barber on 125th. Mm -hmm. From the time you get off the subway to the time you walk to our office, you're seeing a little microcosm of the world. Mm -hmm. And because we're designing products for the world, we think this is critical. But even to that end, there's nothing that can escape being on the ground and really be engaged with people who are living through the issues that you're hoping to address. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I just uh, came back from Nigeria where I took several members of my engineering team mm-hmm. to to the different communities we work in. Yes. So they can just sit there and observe and ask questions uh, and try to understand the day-to-day life of the people who are going through these issues that we're trying to solve in terms of energy generation, in terms of energy sustainability, et cetera. Mm-hmm. In addition, we're looking at who we can hire on the ground to be our eyes and our ears and our R&D partners because we feel like, their perspective is something that you just can't replace with anything else other than the lives that they've lived. All right. Now, you have a long list of accomplishments in the field of entrepreneurship. You are one of Fortune's most 
um, promise women promising entrepreneurs. You've been listed on Forbes 30 under 30 list and named Black Enterprises Innovator of the Year. At the same time, you managed to get your name out in the science field as well as the Scientist of the Year by the Harvard Foundation. So is it safe to call you a scientrepreneur? And if so, could you explain to our listeners why and how you've been able to so effectively balance and thrive immensely in your scientific and entrepreneurial pursuits simultaneously? So I, I, I think the best thing to call me is a problem solver. Right. Um, because, you know, I, science, when people have to look at the definition of that, science is just the study of life. Mm -hmm. And I often tell people that regardless of your background, regardless of your training or education, mm -hmm. if you're living, you're already halfway there mm -hmm. to being a scientist. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is just take what you see in your life and think about it, and now you're a scientist. Uh -huh. And when it comes to the idea of entrepreneurship, All right. you know, I, what I am is someone who understands that to have an impact and to really solve the problems that I want to solve for more than just one or two people, mm -hmm. you need to understand scale. You need to understand systems. You need to understand how to build organizations so that you can solve problems in a massive way. Mm -hmm. And if that means I have to start a business, then I guess that's what I'll do. All if right. that means that I have to, you know, start a sustainable, successful business, mm -hmm. then I guess that's what I'll do. Okay. But that's not really the point. I'm not just doing it because I want to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it because it seems to be the most efficient way to address the problems that I really care about. Okay. So I almost, I, I, I prefer the, I prefer to be called a world-class problem solver. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that because I think that a lot of people have what it takes to do that as well. Okay. Um, and the art of demystifying the spaces of entrepreneurship, uh, technology, and science, to me, it's, it's really important to do um, so that more people who look like me are willing to take the leap into this space. All right. So a world-class problem solver. Mm, now we'll be Ideally. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, now we'll be going back in time a little. Who are your role models growing up and what tips would you give your 15-year-old self? Um, I think as far as role models growing up, I, I was always really inspired, honestly, by uh, my parents. Um, you know, we're talking about people who immigrated from Nigeria to go to university, mm -hmm. um, got their masters, got their PhDs, um, and still instilled a great pride in being Nigerian, you know, in their children and uh, pushed their kids to believe they can do anything and honestly to believe that they must do everything just mm -hmm. to justify being alive, I think. Um, yes, and that was. Yes. I consider that a privilege to have such supportive parents that pushed us to be everything we possibly could be. Um, I'm, I was also always really inspired by Michelle Obama. You know, I, I told someone recently that the last eight years of my life, I, I just turned 29, but yes. for the most part, you know, the last eight years of my life, from 20 to 28, mm -hmm. uh, she was the first lady. Yes. And I don't think I'd be who I am today if during my formative years of determining what it meant to be an adult woman mm -hmm. in this country and mm -hmm. in this world, mm -hmm. I didn't have such an amazing example like the First Lady Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. Just say I'm happy that I grew up during the time under Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. And so she was huge for me. Um, I also, obviously, I think, you know, found Oprah to be amazing in terms of what she had accomplished. Um, I often like to joke with people, too, that uh, I aim to be the perfect love child of Bill Nye, the science guy, and Beyonce. <laughs> um, so all of these people played a huge role okay. in how I think about the world and yes. how I think about what I can do in it. But if I had to choose one, it would definitely be my mom. You know, right. um, she, I wouldn't be where I am without her, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't be going where I, I believe I'm going uh, without her in it as well. Okay. So any tips for your 15-year-old self? Tips for my 15-year-old self, um, ignore boys because they're not, you know, I think I think Michelle said it the best, you know, she was like, <laughs> there's no boy that's cute enough or funny enough or anything to stop doing what you have to do. Okay. And I think that's just key. Uh -huh. um, but I think, I think the big thing is, you know, being just remembered to be very comfortable, you know, with who you are, because I think in the end, you can't always know where you're going, but wherever you end up, you, ideally you know who you are, mm -hmm. and ideally you like who you are. Okay. And so I think I think that I was fortunate enough to be around people, friends and family that allowed me to do that, mm -hmm. but sometimes it can be very easy to just kind of wonder if you're 
growing in the right way or doing the right things yeah. or worrying about the right things. And I think just knowing that ultimately, as long as you know who you are mm-hmm. and uh, and you're happy with that, yes. that's ultimately, I think, the key thing that can get you through almost anything. Okay, now the final question. Today we celebrate the acts of courage and determination by ordinary women who have played an extraordinary role in the history of their countries and communities. Through your ideas and innovations, you have become a role model for many women in the world today. In light of the fact that today is International Women's Day, what motto do you think best sums up any words of encouragement you might like to offer to empower and encourage women and girls the world over? Wow. Um, you know, I, I think that for, for me, it's, it's, it, it can be, you know, being a woman is it's hard. You know, we, uh, we, we have the world on our shoulders and mm-hmm. we often feel like no matter how smart we are or how much ambition we have, sometimes there's just like physical things that keep us back from certain areas and make us afraid to do certain things. And there are certain things that we always have in our mind that our male counterparts don't. Like, we are always worried about okay if i wear x will you know will i be facing y vulnerability Mm -hmm. if i walk down this street it's not an adventure it's you know it's an opportunity to be in danger Mm -hmm. um and so that constant feeling of making sure we're safe is uh it's a lot to handle especially when you're trying to do things in a world where the 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 biggest opportunities are in the places that aren't that safe um you know, the, the, the most exciting impacts are in the places that are dangerous, mm-hmm. especially for women. Mm-hmm. And I think that if there was kind of a word of encouragement that I, I guess I try to say to myself because I'm, I'm only 29 and I still have a good chunk of my life to try to get through with yes. my head up high, yeah. um, it would be don't be afraid to be strong. Uh, I think that a lot of times women are afraid to show that we're not just mentally strong, that we're physically strong, you know, spiritually strong, emotionally strong. And it's, I don't know why, mm-hmm. um, whether it's eating right, whether it's working out, whether it's honestly even lifting weights, mm-hmm. um, whether it's praying, meditation, don't be afraid to be very proudly strong, very okay. outwardly strong in every category that there is. Um, because what did they say? Like, you know, um, there's, I, there's, there's no point in, in behaving like someone who's weak in a world where the adventure requires strength. Ah, that's a very, very inspirational for our listeners out there. Don't be afraid to be strong. That marks the end of our digital discussion series for the Women in Science, Technology and Innovation podcast series. Thank you so much, Jessica, for educating and inspiring our listeners and also for taking time off your busy schedule to be with us here today. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Right. Thank you again for joining UNAI in our digital discussion series podcast. To learn more about UNAI and our activities, visit our website at academicimpact.un.org or join the conversation on social media at ImpactUN.